Hello, welcome to your online lecture for the course Anatomy and Physiology 2. Today we're going to be talking about blood vessels, so we're still in the unit cardiovascular system. Now the term cardiovascular system, cardio refers to the heart and vessels refers to the vascular network. And between the in-class and the online lectures, we've focused quite a bit on the heart structure and function, but now we're going to turn our attention to that vast network of blood vessels that carry life-sustaining blood to nearly every, every component of our body. There are nearly 100,000 kilometers of vessels that are carrying blood throughout your body right now. And these vessels develop through a complex process which is referred to as angiogenesis. Angio means vessel, genesis means the generation or formation of. And this begins during embryonic development, so when you're an embryo inside a uterus, and it continues throughout your lifespan. So let's talk about the different types of blood vessels that we find in the body and what their main role is. We have arteries, capillaries, and veins as some of the main structures. Arteries are going to be responsible for conducting blood away from your heart to the rest of your body. Veins are gonna be conducting blood towards your heart, away from the tissues in your body. And capillaries, they're going to be the small network a small network of vessels that are found within tissue that allow for the exchange of material. So in this image here, we have, this is a small version of an artery and a small version of a vein that connect to this capillary network. So we're going to have nice oxygen nutrient rich blood coming through this artery, which is going to reach the capillary. It's going to diffuse into the tissue and then the waste products and that deoxygenated blood and any excess fluids going to be picked up by the venous system and it's going to leave the tissue and travel back towards the heart. There are several different types of arteries in the cardiovascular system. Elastic arteries are an example, and these are also called conducting arteries. They are the largest in the body, and they are going to include your aorta as well as the major branches off the aorta. Now, as the name implies, elastic arteries are going to be able to stretch without causing injury in order to accommodate this surge of blood that's going to be forced into them and through them when those ventricles contract. And then they have this ability to recoil as the ventricles relax. Muscular arteries are also called distributing arteries and they're going to carry blood farther away from the heart to specific organs and areas of the body. They're smaller in diameter than the elastic arteries are. However, the muscular wall that's found within these vessels is proportionately thicker. So examples that I'll just say out loud now that will come up potentially at some point include brachial, gastric, superior mesenteric. Those are examples of muscular or distributing arteries. Arterioles are also called resistance vessels and they're the smallest of the arteries. Arterioles are not named individually but as a group, they're critically important in regulating blood flow throughout the body. The, they, they function in this way by variable contraction of smooth muscle that's found within their walls, which in turn is going to increase resistance to blood flow and help regulate your blood pressure as well as determining the quantity of blood that go, is going to enter a particular artery. So they have this ability to change their diameter in order to allow for an increase in blood flow to an area or a decrease in blood flow to an area. Meta arterial is the term used to describe the very short connecting vessels that connect a true arterial with the proximal end of anywhere from 20 to 100 capillaries and then extend throughout the capillary bed. And we saw that sort of how it looks a little bit in this image here. It is the meta arterioles that are going to be very important when we discuss nutrient and oxygen diffusion at the level of the tissue. 
This is a flow chart showing you that when we start off at the level of the heart, we have elastic arteries, then blood moves into muscular arteries, then into arterioles, then into meta arterioles, then at the capillary level, diffusion will occur, and then we clear that tissue through venules, which are just small veins, and then into veins and back to the heart. This slide is showing you what we call the microcirculation, so at the level of the tissue, where we can see the arterial, venule, and the capillary bed. We can also see the meta-arterial. Remember, we spoke about that earlier. And there are these sphincters that are present. They're called pre-capillary sphincters. And these pre-capillary sphincters are going to be either relaxed or contracted. If they're relaxed, they're going to allow the flow of blood into the tissue, allowing it to also flow back into then afterwards, rather the venule. If they are contracted, then it's going to prevent the flow of blood into the capillary bed, and instead, blood's going to go from the arterial into the venule through what's called a thoroughfare channel. So I'll just phrase that in a different way. So true capillaries are going to be, so these are the capillaries, are going to be receiving blood flowing out of these small arterioles. If that pre-capillary tone is relaxed, then blood will flow into the capillaries. If it is high or contracted, it's going to allow very little blood into the capillaries. And that's one of the ways that we regulate the amount of blood flow at the level of our microcirculation to our tissues. Capillaries are often categorized into three groups by really relating to the ease of the passage of substances through their walls, because that's how the tissues receive their nutrients and their blood flow is through the walls. So we can classify capillaries by really their structural differences that affect their permeability or how easily substances can move through. So we have continuous capillaries, fenestrated capillaries, and sinusoids. Continuous capillaries or capillaries have a continuous lining of endothelial cells. Endothelial cells make up the wall of our vessels with only small openings that are called intracellular clefts that exist between them. Continuous capillaries are typically found in skeletal muscles. They're also found in the lung and in other tissues in the body as well. Fenestrated capillaries also have those intracellular clefts between the, the lining of the endothelial cells, but in addition to that, they also have small holes or what we call fenestrations through the plasma membrane itself that can facilitate exchange functions. Sinusoids, this is the term that's used to describe the type of capillary or capillary that has a much larger lumen, that's the, the opening, the, the open hollow part of a vessel. So it has a much larger lumen and more winding or what we can say torturous course, that's how the capillary takes this more winding or torturous course compared to other capillary vessels. The basement membrane that completely covers capillaries is going to be either absent or incomplete when we talk about sinusoids. In addition, the fenestrations that are present with sinusoids are quite large, so this means that they are very porous. They have great porosity, meaning they can permit the migration of even cells moving in and out of the vessel. So I just brought up a couple of images to show you the continuous capillary versus the fenestrated. You can see those small holes and then the sinusoids, which have much larger openings present. Now let's look at the layers or the walls that make up our blood vessels. The walls, arteries, and veins are going to consist of three separate layers, or you could even call them coats, that are called the tunica externa, tunica media, and tunica intima. These layers are arranged in a sequence from the outside to the middle and then to the interior surface of the vessel. As blood vessels decrease in diameter, as we'll see in this image, the relative thickness of their walls 
also decrease. So let's start with the outermost layer, and that's called the tunica externa. Externa is outside, and the name literally means outside coat. It is also called the tunica adventia. This layer is made up of very strong, flexible fibrous connective tissue. This layer prevents tearing of the vessel walls during body movement, so it has to be tough. It has collagen fibers that are gonna be present that sort of extend outward from this layer, connecting it to a nearby structure. So it sort of helps anchor that vessel in place and help keep the lumen of the vessel open. And we can see that layer here. The middle layer is called the tunica media, which is Latin for middle coat. It is made up of a layer of smooth muscle tissue that's sandwiched together with a layer of elastic connective tissue. The presence of smooth muscle tissue is going to allow for changes in blood vessel diameter, so it acts as something that can dilate or constrict blood vessels. And we can see that layer here. And then the tunica intima, that's the innermost layer, meaning inside coat. This layer is made up of endothelium, endothelial tissue, that is continuous with the endothelium that lines the heart. The endothelium has a basement membrane that supports it, and this layer is going to be found in all vessels. That means it's present in arteries, it's present in veins, and it's present in capillaries. Both the tunica externa and the tunica media are going to be found in arteries and veins. Let's have a look at the components that make up the blood vessel wall. Regardless of how thick a vessel wall is going to be, there are a few different types of material that can make up the vessels, the ones that are commonly present. So we have endothelial tissue, which is also known as endothelium. You might remember that from ANP1. This is a specific type of simple squamous epithelial tissue. Simple is the same as saying a single layer. Squamous are these kind of flat, scaly cells. And this tissue is very capable of secreting chemicals, but also reproducing new cells which is important because blood vessels get injured. Collagen fibers are found in the vascular wall and they're woven together much like the reinforcing strands that you would see in say the wall of a hose. Collagen fibers are gonna to function to keep the lumen of the vessel open and add really strength and integrity to the wall. So they do exhibit some flexibility, but it's still that stretchability or flexibility is still going to be limited. Now elastic fibers, these are composed of a protein called elastin. And elastic fibers are capable of stretching more than 100% under certain physiologic conditions. So the fibers, the elastin fibers, are going to allow for recoil after distension. So after stretching, it allows them to recoil back to the state they were without being damaged. So this property of elastic fibers plays an important role in meaning what we call a passive tension in the vessels of the cardiovascular system. This type of passive tension is required in order for us to maintain normal blood pressure levels throughout our entire cardiac cycle. Lastly, we have smooth muscle cells. Smooth muscle cells are found in the wall of all segments of the vascular system except for capillaries. So in other words, capillaries don't have muscle within their walls. Remember from first year, first term anatomy that smooth muscle is involuntary. So smooth muscle cells that are present within these vessel walls, there's numerous of them, and they're going to allow for the control of the movement of blood and how much blood through our vascular system. It is the smooth muscle cells that are going to exert an active tension because it's a muscle in these vessels when they contract. 
Okay, so we have two different systems when we talk about our cardiovascular system. We have the pulmonary and the systemic, pulmonary circulation and systemic circulation. Pulmonary is referring to the lungs. This is just the system that goes to and from the lungs. So it's going to be under lower pressure than the systemic circulation because that's going to and from the heart, but throughout the rest, throughout the entire body. We also have this portal system here where blood is flowing through the systemic circulation, but you can see it's passing through two different capillary beds, two consecutive capillary beds. So that's in our GI tract. A few additional terms, we have end arteries. These are just arteries that will eventually diverge or end at capillaries. The term arterial anastomosis involves the merger of one artery directly into another artery. Sometimes this develops as a response to a disease. So if somebody has an artery that is not able to properly bring blood flow to a tissue, another connection can form so that that, blood, that tissue still receives, receives blood. It's sort of like a, a bypass. And arterial anastomoses are more likely to be seen as we move further away from the heart. And arteriovenous anastomoses, or shunts, these occur when blood flows from an artery directly into a vein, so without passing through a capillary bed. And this can happen, let's say, for example, somebody's experiencing hypothermia. We can avoid further heat loss by avoiding the passage of blood through the capillary bed. So you can shunt blood from the skin arteries directly into the veins instead of having it go through a capillary bed where you would experience further heat loss. And so those, those sphincters that we talked about on a previous slide become quite important. We're going to have a look at the principal arteries and veins of the body. And there are a lot, but I'm going to highlight the ones that you specifically need to be aware of on upcoming slides. So we're looking at different regions of the body and just to orient yourself here, we have the heart that would be located in this region here and then there's the aorta that branches off the heart. And so we call it the ascending aorta because it is ascending off the heart. And then as it hooks around, it's called the aortic arch. And then as it drops down into the thoracic area, it's going to be called the descending aorta as it goes all the way down. However, the different areas that that descending aorta is present will have a different name. So we have the thoracic aorta in the thoracic region. Then it's going to pierce through the diaphragm, a very important muscle for our ability to breathe, where it's going to change its name to the abdominal aorta when it's in the abdominal region. You can see throughout the process, we have all these other arteries that come off and are going to supply specific areas, but I want to bring your attention to the phrenic arteries. We have a superior phrenic and an inferior phrenic artery. These are going to supply the diaphragm. And if the diaphragm does not have blood supply or does not have nerve supply, it cannot function. So a very important artery. We're going to go back up to the aorta and remember that right off the heart when the aorta comes off, we have these two branches here that are called the coronary arteries. So we have the left and right coronary arteries that we talked about in class, and we know they're going to supply the heart muscle itself so that it can survive. Few important other structures, and these will come up on our next two slides as well, you'll be able to see it in different ways, is right off that aortic arch we have a variety of different important branches. I want you to notice here that these two come off separately, come off on their own, right off the aorta. And one of them is called the left common carotid and one is called the left subclavian. But on the right side, it's a little bit different. We have a right common carotid and a right subclavian, but they don't come off the aorta itself. They come off, off of another branch that's called the brachiocephalic artery. 
So on the right side then, we have a brachiocephalic artery coming right off the aorta and then it branches into the right subclavian and the right common carotid. And then on the left side, we have coming right off the aorta, the left subclavian and the left common carotid artery. And we're going to elaborate on this on upcoming slides and then we're going to move into different structures or regions of the body and look at some other important arteries. And I should also mention too that any arteries that are kind of heading up are going to be supplying the more superior parts of the body. Ones that are heading downward obviously are going to supply the more downward parts, the, the lower parts of the body. So let's have a look here again at that brachiocephalic artery. So to orient you, let's go back. We're looking at this branch here that splits into two. So let's see what that looks like from this view. The brachiocephalic branch is going to branch into the right subclavian. And then this one that goes up, so this one sort of heads down, this one goes up, and that's the common carotid, that right common carotid artery. And so what I need you to know now is that as this artery travels up, you'll see it splits into two main branches. So in other words, the common carotid artery is going to split into an internal carotid and an external carotid artery. One is going to be traveling internal to the brain and we can see all the branches looking at the inferior part of the brain, uh, the cerebellum and the brainstem, are, they're all going to get their blood supply. But it's the external carotid artery that's going to be more external as you can see in this image. The other important artery to point out is the vertebral artery which runs up along the vertebrae. And if somebody is in a car accident where they're or they're playing a football game and their head goes into way beyond normal range of motion, you can get tearing of this artery and the structures in that area, if they lose their blood supply, you could see why that would be detrimental. So let's look at the major arteries now of the upper extremity. And what have we talked about so far? Well, remember that brachiocephalic artery, and we're just focusing on the right side right now. The brachiocephalic artery we know is going to branch into that right common carotid and it's also going to branch into the subclavian artery. The right common carotid we said is going to head upward and split into the external and internal carotid artery, but the subclavian artery is going to travel down to supply the arm. So we follow it along here, it's traveling down to supply the arm and it's going to change its name. If we follow it through, you can see now it's called the axillary artery once it reaches the level of the armpit area, which is called the axillary region. And if we follow it down even more and we get into the actual upper arm, so we've left the armpit area, it's going to split into the brachial arteries. Brachial, when you hear that term, think of the arm. So it's going to have a deep branch, one that's going to travel deeper, and then a more superficial branch that's going to travel more superficially. Then as we pass the elbow, we're going to split into two additional arteries that come off of that brachial artery. And that's the radial artery on the radial side, and the, because this is the radius and the ulnar artery on the ulnar side, and we know that that's the ulna. Referring to the bones, of course. And then once we get to the hand, we end up with the digital arteries. And it's going, those arteries are going to supply the digits or the fingers. So an important piece of information clinically is that right around here, and even in your thumb, you can palpate the radial artery where it's, you can feel pulse. So this is where you would take your pulse on the palmer side, you would take your pulse and you can also feel a bit of a pulse in your thumb. And that's why if you are taking somebody's or even your own, you're, you're, having, you're examining their pulse or your own pulse, you shouldn't use your thumb because your thumb has a pulse so it can skew your findings. 
Now we'll look at the major arteries of the lower extremity. So we're working on down and we are still focusing on the right side. I had mentioned earlier that when the aorta reaches the abdomen, it's called the abdominal aorta. It's still the descending aorta though. And then once it reaches the pelvis or around the level of the iliac crest, and that's the iliac crest right here, that's a, a bony landmark, it's going to split into the common iliac arteries. So you can see common iliac artery here on uh, the right side. And then the common iliac artery, and again, we're just focusing on the one side, but the same would be true on the other side, is going to split into the external iliac artery and the internal iliac artery. So similar to how the common carotid artery split into the external and the internal, one is going to travel deeper and be responsible for deeper structures compared to the external iliac artery. If we follow along the external iliac artery, we can see that once we get to the femur, which is right here, it's now called the femoral, or I should say femoral artery. And then the last few arteries in the lower leg to be aware of, we have the fibular artery, which is going to run alongside the fibula on the lateral aspect of the leg. And then we have the anterior and posterior tibial artery, Remember the tibia is the larger bone that's a bit more medial than the, than the fibula, but it's the larger, more sort of anterior bone. And then we have the digital arteries, just like we did when we talked about the hand. Now we're going to talk about the principal veins of the body. So the arteries that we just spoke about are going to be coming from the heart, where the heart will pump oxygenated nutrient-rich blood into the arterial system to travel to all of our tissues. And then the venous system is going to carry deoxygenated blood, blood that has left the tissues away from the tissues. Veins are really ultimately extensions of capillaries. Capillaries, remember, are at the level of the tissue, and they're going to unite into vessels of increasing size to form venules and then form veins. The large veins of the cranial cavity are not really called veins, but instead they're called dural sinuses. Um, they should not be confused with the sinuses of the skull that are air filled. This is different. And then the final point to make before we move on is that veins are going to, going to communicate with each other in the same way that arteries do through anastomoses. These are connections. So in this image here, we're looking at the inferior vena cava primarily and its tributaries. And I want you to note the close anatomical relationship between the inferior vena cava and the descending aorta. And it's not shown on here, but so here uh, completely, but here would be the descending aorta that we know pierces through the diaphragm, so thoracic part and abdominal part. And then we have the inferior vena cava here, which would travel up towards the heart, bringing blood to the heart. And you can see how it lines up with the descending aorta. The important veins that you'll need to be aware of include the superior vena cava and that inferior vena cava. So remember, if the heart is located here, it's going to be that inferior vena cava that dumps blood into the right atrium along with that superior vena cava. The reason we have a superior and an inferior is that we can bring blood from the inferior part of the body to the heart and we can bring blood from the superior part of the body to the heart. Okay, you also need to be aware of the brachiocephalic vein. That term should be familiar from the brachiocephalic artery. And so there are, although there are exceptions, many of the veins are named the same as the arteries, except they have the term vein versus artery. And it would make sense because if you, if the brachiocephalic artery is going to be one of its parts is going to be supplying the upper arm, we also need to drain the upper arm. And so it gets usually a name 
that is very similar or the same. But that's not always true. Okay, you can see in this diagram the subclavian vein and the brachiocephalic vein. Similar in their position and similar or same as the name of the artery. Now the exception, one of the exceptions to the rule of the same name is going to be the jugular vein, whose arterial match, so to speak, would be the carotid artery. So if oxygenated blood travels to the head through the carotid artery, then the deoxygenated blood is going to leave the head through the jugular vein. And so what we can see here then is the internal jugular vein and the, well, that was the external, but external and internal jugular vein. So this image here is showing you the draining that would occur of the brain. And you can see that it's the internal jugular vein that's going to drain the brain just like the internal carotid artery would supply it. And so this internal jugular vein is going to drain blood from those dural sinuses that I mentioned, that term I mentioned earlier. So it's the dural sinuses that are going to collect blood from the brain and cerebral spinal fluid and bring it into the internal jugular vein. And so the reason it gets its name dural sinus is because these sinuses, these venous sinuses are found within the dura matter or dura mater, which you might recall from first year anatomy. Here's the major veins now of the upper extremity that we're going to have a look at. This is an anterior view. The major veins of the upper extremity include the subclavian vein and the brachiocephalic vein, as already mentioned. The axillary vein is located at the level of the axilla or armpit, so similar to the axillary artery. Once in the humerus region, the main vein is called the brachial vein. We also have another branch here that's a new term called the basilic vein. And this is the vein that's most commonly used to remove blood from the body for sampling or for adding blood to the body. So if you've ever had to have blood drawn or an IV set up, it will commonly be, the access point will be the basilic vein. So right around this region usually. Once past the elbow, two main venous branches include the ulnar vein and the radial vein. And going along with trends, the digital veins for the fingers, for the digits. Now we're going to look at the major veins of the lower extremity, still on that right side of the body for um, simplicity. We're going to look at that inferior vena cava. So that's a structure that came all the way from the heart, all the way down into once we reach the level of the pelvis where it's going to branch into a common iliac vein and an external iliac vein and an internal iliac vein. Then we're going to reach the level of the femur where we have the femoral vein. There's another important vein that has a different name. It's called the great saphenous vein. Once we get below the knee, then we're getting into your posterior and anterior tibial veins, we do have continuation of that great saphenous vein and then a smaller branch as well. And then of course, we can't forget the fibular vein. Sometimes you'll, when you see the term fibula, you might instead see the term peroneal, they mean the same thing. And then the digital veins. So I'm sure you were quite happy with the overlap between arteries and veins. So that's the end of talking about the veins that are going to be traveling throughout our body, in particular, the veins of the extremity in the head. And all of the blood in those veins is going to travel, as we've already talked about, back to the right side of the heart through the superior and inferior vena cava so that that blood can then be pumped through push through the heart into the right ventricle as we know, and then out to the lungs where it can be oxygenated and then sent back to the heart to be pumped to the rest of the body. But more of that is to come in another lecture. 
But when it comes to certain structures, the spleen, the stomach, the pancreas, gallbladder, and intestines, instead of that blood in those veins going straight to the inferior vena cava and then into the right atrium, it's first going to send their blood to the liver through something called the hepatic portal vein. So we can see the hepatic portal vein here. You can see this is the liver. This is the gallbladder. This is your intestines. This is your pancreas that's sort of cut off the center part here. And then we have the stomach. So before this blood travels to the heart, it first has to go through the liver and then it will end up in the inferior vena cava and can travel to the heart. So I'm gonna give you an example of what's happening here. Let's say you eat some ice cream and you swallow the ice cream and it ends up in your stomach. We'll learn a lot more about this in the digestive unit. Then it's going to end up in your intestines. Your body's going to absorb the nutrients into the venous system. Then those nutrients, that nutrient-rich blood is going to travel to the liver and the liver's sort of going to process that blood. But one of the things the, the liver is going to do is try to take out some of that excess glucose and store it in the liver for later. Alternatively, maybe the blood sugar levels are, are low. As blood runs through here, the liver can actually dump some of its stored blood, stored glucose rather, into the blood. Another advantage of it passing through the liver first before returning to the heart is that it can get rid of anything that's toxic, including alcohol. So you, you consume alcohol, it ends up in your stomach and gets absorbed into these veins here. It's going to, if it went right to the heart and pumped it out to the rest of the body, you can imagine how toxic that is. So instead, it's going to travel to the liver where the liver is going to detoxify it before it ends up into your inferior vena cava, to the heart, to the lungs, then back to the heart and to the rest of the body. And so that's why it's important to keep your liver healthy because it's detoxifying whatever is being absorbed into you through your stomach and your intestines. It's going to detox it before you're sending it to all of your tissues. So just to reiterate that again, blood from the, the stomach, the pancreas, the uh, spleen and the gallbladder. I didn't mention the spleen, that's right here or I didn't show you, is all going to first enter through the liver, enter to the liver through the hepatic portal vein, portal because it's, a, it's, a, it's called portal circulation. So it ends up in this hepatic portal vein, goes through the liver, it's detoxified, and then it's going to exit the liver through what's called the hepatic veins. So make sure you know the difference here between the hepatic portal vein, which is the blood is entering into the liver or entering into that portal circulation and leaving through hepatic veins. The term hepatic refers to liver. And then it's going to end up in the inferior vena cava and sent back up to the heart where it's going to join in with normal circulation. So now we're talking about a little bit of a different concept pertaining to a fetus and circulation in the body before birth is very necessarily different from circulation after birth. And the main reason is that fetal blood secures oxygen and nutrients from the maternal blood instead of using its own lung, lungs and digestive organs. So it's necessary that we have special adaptations in place. The placenta consists of both fetal and maternal tissue. And we can see sort of the maternal side and the fetal side here. You can see that the placenta would be here attached to the uterine wall, which is heavily vascularized. So this would be the endometrium, part of the uterine wall. And the heavy vascularization is what allows for the proper exchange of nutrients between mom and the baby. The bulk of the exchange between the mother and the fetus is going to occur at what's called the chorionic villi. So that's where the exchange is happening. And then we have the umbilical cord here, 
which is that mechanism by which blood can get to and from the baby. So we're still, still on that topic of in utero, talking about fetal circulation. So this here is showing you fetal circulation. So in utero before a baby's born. And if we look closely, we can see some, some special adaptations that are in place. So for example, we can see that the umbilical cord consists of both umbilical arteries and an umbilical vein. So I'm going to highlight here the umbilical vein and the umbilical arteries. Now, if you look at this, you might be thinking that's strange that the vein is red and that there's this purple color associated with the arteries. And there's a special reason for that as we'll talk about soon. But I do want you to make note that there is one vein that makes up the umbilical cord and two arteries, which you can see. So those vessels are special features that adapt the baby to its life in the womb. There are other features that you need to know as well. Of course, the placenta is one of them. We also have what's called a ductus venosus present here. And we have a foramen ovale, which if we follow it through, you can see this, it's a hole here which I'll talk about soon. Foramen means hole or opening. There's also a ductus arteriosus. And the reason we have these additional adaptations is, as I already mentioned, the lungs aren't gonna be used for diffusion, so other structures must do this instead. And when I say diffusion, I mean the movement of oxygen and carbon dioxide and, um, in order for survival. And so it's the placenta that really acts as that structure that helps for the diffusion, as I showed you already. Here you can more clearly see the maternal side. So this would be attached to the uterus and the fetal side of the placenta. Let's look at the umbilical arteries. We know there are two of them. And the two umbilical arteries are branches of the common iliac arteries. And you can see that here. So common iliac artery, and we have these branches that come off, and these are the umbilical arteries. And remember, I'm talking about branching off the fetal blood vessels, not the maternal. So this is the, we're talking about the baby's blood supply. So it's going to uh, branch off there and carry fetal blood to the placenta, following these arrows, to the placenta, where that diffusion is going to occur. In other words, this is where it's going to become oxygenated. The umbilical vein traveling in the opposite direction is going to now take this just oxygenated blood away from the placenta and into the fetal circulation, entering the fetal body. And we can see this here is the umbilicus or the belly button. So following this along, remember this is oxygenated blood is going to be traveling up into the ductus venosus structure that we spoke about earlier. The ductus venosus then is just a continuation of the umbilical vein. And it's just on the underside of the undersurface of the liver here where it's going to drain into the inferior vena cava. Most blood does actually bypass the liver, except for a, a very small amount that you can see on the diagram. So blood is moving up now through the inferior vena cava, and we have this other structure here called the foramen ovale. The foramen ovale is an opening in the septum or the wall between the right and the left atrium or atria. So the movement of this blood from the right atria into the left atria bypasses the lungs because we know normally 
it would travel through here and then to the lungs as we've introduced in class to be oxygenated. But what's happening now is instead, a lot of the blood's going to pass through this foramen ovale from the right side of the heart into the left side of the heart, where it will then be moved into the left ventricle and pumped up through the aortic arch where it will travel down through the abdominal aorta and then end up in these umbilical arteries. Now it's not a perfect system because you may have, have noticed that yes, blood can pass through here from the right atria to the left atria, but you've also noticed that some is ending up in the right ventricle, which under normal circumstances, we know when we're not talking about the fetus, that this would end up moving through that pulmonary valve into what I only briefly introduced as the pulmonary trunk, and then it would travel to the lungs to be oxygenated, and then remember, make its way back to the left atrium once it is oxygenated. So. What, do, what happens with this blood that ends up in the right ventricle? Well, it will pass up through that pulmonary trunk, but we have this little blood vessel called the ductus arteriosus. And it's a bit hard to see here, but it's a connection that is going to, instead of moving blood here to the lungs like we would normally expect, it's going to divert or detour that blood back into the same area that we want it to be, which is the aortic arch. So let's have a review of that. But before I review it, I want to mention to you in case you're wondering why this is purple and not red. And that's because almost all of the fetal blood is a mixture of oxygenated and deoxygenated blood. So instead of being that rich red oxygenated color, it takes on a mix between red and blue, being purple. So let's have a look at that again. Okay, so we have these two umbil umbilical arteries that are branches of the common, common iliac artery that are going to bring blood to the placenta, deoxygenated blood to be oxygenated, and this is where diffusion is going to occur. Then the umbilical vein is going to bring this oxygenated blood from the placenta to enter the fetal body through that umbilicus. Then it's going to travel into the umbilical vein, which is going to, on the underside of the liver, become the ductus venosus. Blood is going to be brought into that right atrium. Some of it's going to end up in that right ventricle. And then once it heads into the pulmonary trunk, it's gonna be detoured by that ductus arteriosus. Instead of going to the lungs, it's gonna be brought right back into the aortic arch. So you can think of that ductus arteriosus as just being a connection between the pulmonary trunk here and the aorta, which normally blood doesn't mix there. And then it's going to travel down the abdominal aorta where you're going to have blood eventually returning into those common iliac veins and then into the umbilical arteries. But then the other situation, which happens more frequently, is you are getting blood that is moving from the right atrium directly into the left ventricle, the left atrium, and then from there it's going to end up on the left side of the heart and right into the aorta, following the same pathway. And it's doing that through a hole that is in the septum, the septum that divides the right and left atria, called the foramen ovale. And of course, the fetus is going to be receiving the oxygen nutrient rich blood from vessels that are carrying that oxygen nutrient rich blood. And then those tissues are going to be drained by vessels that carry deoxygenated blood. So that is in utero, what happens postnatally? Well, after birth and within the first year of life, certain changes are going to occur in the baby's circulatory system in order to adapt the 
baby's body to life outside the womb. So there's going to be this major shift in blood flow as the lungs and the heart are now going to be used as we know is normally the case. The umbilical cord and placenta obviously are no longer part of the baby. The umbilical arteries become what's called umbilical ligaments. So the umbilical arteries become umbil umbilical ligaments and the umbilical vein becomes another ligament, but it ends up becoming the round ligament of the liver. So these are fetal remnants. The ductus arteriosus, shown up here, that connection that we talked about is going to degrade and it's going to become a ligament as well, the ligamentum arteriosum. So this was the connection between the pulmonary trunk and the aorta. And then the foramen ovale is going to uh, close off. So that's that opening, that hole between the right and the left atrium. And it's going to close and become what's called the fossa ovalis, which would just show you a bit of a remnant of where that foramen ovale was, but it should close off. Now there's some issues that can happen where in some babies, the foramen ovale does not close off and this has to be corrected with surgery because that mixing of blood will be very problematic as you could imagine. I'm going to wrap up the lecture talking for just a moment about normal and abnormal changes with blood vessels. Some normal changes that can occur with the cardiovascular system include a thickening of the myocardium, so the heart can get heart muscle can get thicker and stronger. But in terms of the blood vessel, there is can be an increase in the blood supply of your skeletal muscle tissue through a process called angiogenesis. So exercise will actually increase the development of new blood vessels. But with age getting into adulthood and later adulthood and most certainly with poor lifestyle choices what can be seen is atherosclerotic plaques which cause a condition called atherosclerosis can be seen uh, in the arteries and what this is going to do is block the normal flow of blood through critical arteries um, over time narrowing the vessel it can also cause clots to form because it's damaged tissue which can block blood supply completely or the clots can travel to other structures, which can lead to heart attacks and damage to many different tissues in the body if it's reduced in the feet here, as can be seen with people that are diabetics, it can cause necrotic tissue or what's called gangrene leading to amputation potentially. With age as well, heart valves and just the muscle tissue itself can start to degenerate. And if the heart is not, the structure has changed, then naturally the function would as well. So pumping efficiency is reduced and much of this can be avoided with exercise. So not leading a sedentary lifestyle, but also intentionally exercising, eating healthy and making sure that you're not doing things such as smoking. That is the end of today's lecture. Thank you so much for your time.